Okay, so welcome everybody. Um, obviously, I will. The topic of the day is about millimeter versus centimeter waves. But before getting into that, I'll give you a quick update on uh, what some demos and things that we found out on the tactile internet. So let's start out with that topic as we then move into which frequencies to use. If we touch and feel an object and we move it in front of our face, we want to see a reaction. Our eyes want to see that this reaction happens. And it turns out this has to be within a millisecond. Uh, sorry. And so that means we have the problem of moving from today's LTE, best case 50 millisecond, down to a single millisecond when we want to have something react. This is known from uh, flight simulators. It's called simulator sickness. If the screens don't move fast enough, you get sick to your stomach. You know this from car simulators. If you go and buy a fancy expensive car and go like into the Volkswagen factory in Dresden, and uh, go into the drive simula simulator, you get sick to your stomach because you don't have the millisecond latency set up there, but it's actually slower. Um, now the question is, we as telephony people have known that 100 milliseconds is important for speech, for voice. How can we now say that one millisecond is important? Because 100 millisecond impor is important for interactivity. Well, these guys know already that the... Uh, 100 millisecond is not enough, the gamers, and that's why they come together in these rooms and make sure that the connectivity is short because in one millisecond, light travels only 300 kilometers. Wireless people know speed of light is really cumbersomely slow. So what did we do? We also set up these goggles, uh, an experiment with Oculus goggles, put some cameras up front to show you what is the difference between a millisecond and a millisecond. So I guess the video has to be done manually here. It doesn't play. Okay. So what I wanted to show you here is, uh, it plays very nicely on my thing. Uh, what I wanted to show you is actually an experiment where we throw a ball and the person tries to catch it. And you can really see the, the impact of every single millisecond uh, with this experiment. Because what happens is as you throw a ball, the speed of the ball is actually te 10 meters per second, which means one centimeter per millisecond. So if you try to catch a ball and the delay is five millisecond, you actually catch the ball with a displacement of five centimeters. And you can actually really see that. So even though we know from telephony that 100 milliseconds is fast enough in terms of latency, it is not fast enough to catch a ball, to interact with our environment. And for that reason, uh, let's have another look at uh, a case where we today already have this one millisecond in place which is cars. If we look at the electronic stability control, the ESC between the wheels of the cars, the end-to-end -end control here has to be a millisecond. And why? Because the car is, an axle is one meter 50, the axles are powered at three meters, approximately. So we're talking about a resonance frequency of 100 hertz, and control systems theory tells us we have to sample 10 times per period and inter counter any resonance, then we can counter any resonance even if it's a nonlinear induced uh, system, a resonance frequency. So that means um, what happens otherwise, because as the car is edging around the corner and starting to spin, you want to make sure that it doesn't go start jiggling along at 100 hertz and then gets goes on out of control, but that it is much faster. Now, if we look at um, electronic stability controls of platoons of the future, it turns out by talking to Bosch, uh, we were pointed out that there's a big issue with autonomous cars. Why? We all want to have this kind of an autonomous car. If we go into heavy downtown traffic, we don't want to have to drive the car ourselves. On these nice country roads out here, it's fine, it's fun, but in downtown traffic, it's no fun. So what do we want to have? We want to have these cars platooning so that we have highly densely packed traffic going whizzing through downtown areas. But now the problem is if this car has a distance control, what happens in a normal situation, you as a driver sit there, you accelerate, you decelerate, accelerate, decelerate. Yes, you continuously sort of move back and forth 
in terms of distance from the car in front of you. And everything is okay if this car doesn't notice it and you don't notice that the car in behind you doesn't notice it. So if it's a decoupled system, and that happens if the distance is big enough. However, if the distance is reduced, these systems become coupled. Then you have a second order system coupled with another second order system coupled with another second order system. And then we have a traffic jam. Yes. And it is also known that if we couple three second order systems, then we actually generate an unstable system, a sixth order system, which cannot be made stable. So we now have to start coupling these cars with each other. And now think of the front car taking control of the back cars and the front being a Renault and behind it is a Porsche and a BMW. And think of that, that the Renault is supposed to control the Porsche and BMW. That's not going to happen. So we need an infrastructure that takes care of this. We also need an infrastructure because the number of connections obviously is n squared and it grows with n squared, so we need some kind of a system. To make sure that we could show you this, demonstrate this once, uh, Frank Fitzing and I, we went and bought uh, eight Lego Mindstorm packs and had ninth grade school kids that did a two weeks internship earlier this year at our place. Um, put these things together, you see they have a camera up front and they follow the black line as the track and they have a decoupled distance because you see everything is fine, they wiggle along this black line and everything's fine. So now we thought how do we make sure that we get into this experimental problem? So we added the bar cardboard box and blocked the first car, the first car stops, the second car stops, the third car stops the fourth car starts wiggling and jiggling, and now the second car starts wiggling and jiggling soon as well. So this is what you don't want to have in downtown traffic. Yes, and uh, this very nicely shows because Frank and I said, we have to somehow find out if these physics guys and the Bosch guys are really uh, there for the real and true. So obviously, if we start doing that, we can then also take away uh, traffic lights, we can have a person carry a cell phone and just walk across the street and have a personal bubble around it. And so as you walk across, across the street, nobody hits you. And even the frog with the implanted cell phone is happy. <laughs> um, you know this, some of you know this. So we had this experiment of this tactile internet uh, intersection in Australia. Obviously it's illegal in Germany, so we had to go to Australia to make this happen. And here you see now the tactile internet happen. We see that we have platoons of cars actually moving across this nice little intersection. Uh, you see this happens very nicely. Everything is good. Even now the Australian police car that is coming here on the right hand side obeys to the rules and actually manages to feed into the system. And you know me, uh, I'm the person always carrying a backpack. So you'll see me coming in here now on the left hand side. Um, as I cross the road, first the guy comes from the right and now I come from the left. Uh, and it was sort of a little bit scary, but you get used to it. <laughs> so, just to make sure, this was not me. This is Fernando Lifschitz, uh, a media artist from Australia that has put this video together and it's available on the web and uh, I thought it's a very nice illustration of the idea. Now if you want to see what is the idea behind that, I think this is what my... Currently I love this slide most. Because what am I talking about? Cordless telephony existed once and it was not successful as cellular was. It is a successful story, but it's not as successful as seller. Why? Because remember telepoint services. I'm old enough to know that, yes? Uh, there was telepoint, and so we all thought digital Ericsson cordless telephony, decked systems, right? Um, they would be sort of so cheap and readily available, we'd make every payphone booth into a uh, publicly available accessible payphone, and whenever we want to make a phone call, we just walk to the next payphone, use it, and call. The problem is, how do we tell the person we want to reach to move towards a payphone? Yes, so all the experiments like in Walnut Creek, like in Dortmund and other places, they were all showing the same psychological study. 
that it fails because it doesn't make sense, because we don't have ubiquitous coverage. So we need ubiquitous coverage to make sure that we can not only initiate a call, but we can terminate it on the other end and actually reach and touch everything. And this is now moving, obviously, to the Internet of Things, where we can then get um, connected to any device, and any device can talk to any device. This is the world we know. What I was talking about so far now is actually taking remote controls and building a remote control infrastructure. This is what it is about. It's not this. It's this. Yes, where we actually here now, we fly out of reach, out of range, and the heli crashes. So we have remote controls all over. Yes, the remote control of the construction worker controlling the crane, uh, the excavator, whatever all, drones, we have cars parking in into a parking lot, remote control by a cell phone, whatever all. Now think of a whole remote control infrastructure so that we really can control, in a sense, steer and control objects. And once we do that, then we can revolutionize the world. Obviously, for this, we need to be able to transmit packets of a certain size, and we'll talk about that later. But I'll, we also need to make sure that we then come up with the right networking and wireless infrastructure that could do this, because now it's about one millisecond end-to-end uh, -end latencies. We have to make sure that we can do the right chips. We have to make sure that the edge cloud is implemented. We cannot have the cloud control server sitting in Alaska. Or, or like I'm in Dresden and the nearest Google server farm is in Krakow, which is a thousand kilometers line distance. So going back and forth, speed of light already is six to seven milliseconds. So that's not going to do it. So we need a mobile edge cloud, the edge cloud server in every access point in any base station, and we have to check out the applications and to, uh, try to understand that we put together this 5G Lab Germany with a whole bunch of companies supporting us very nicely. These are uh, the team members. Uh, we have quite a few researchers involved, and we've also started 26 companies in our history so far, not on tactile internet applications, but covering these four different tracks, showing that we can not only solve equations, but we can actually do some real stuff. Now let's go get back to the packets. And now come to the millimeter versus centimeter. So if a packet is to be transmitted over wireless interface twice, from a control device to the infrastructure, infrastructure to the object to be controlled, and we have still all kinds of stuff in between, a packet duration can be on the send in the order of 10 microseconds. If we have one kilobyte packet, uh, data is just a simple control object, and uh, that means we have an instantaneous rate of a gigabit. Now, for resilience reasons, we need multiple links, et cetera, et cetera. So short latency does mean also fairly high data rate. And that's one reason why we haven't seen these short latencies so far in the previous systems. Um, which means, obviously, yes, we have to not only crawl up this chart, the wireless roadmap, uh, increasing the data rate 10x every five years, um, just for the fun of it, because we're doing this um, for moving objects, data objects, but we also have to have a fairly good, strong bandwidth to make sure that we can get the control system in place. Now, if we're talking about these very high data rates, and if you look at this, I mean, Wi-Fi, we're talking about one terabit per second, only 10 years away, which is, uh, I mean, uh, 2015 this year. 10 years ahead of standardization, we have to come up with some ideas of how to do that. Uh, the question is where to go. Obviously, this is a famous slide from Jonathan Well, um, showing that there is a ton of frequency. Why? If we say 60 gigs is something we consider today for wireless communication, it's 20 dB attenuation per kilometer, but we're talking about cell sizes of only 100 meters. So, it's not 20 dB, it's 2 dB. And if we then look at these frequencies here, or even these frequencies, or those, we have plenty waiting for us to be harvested with like 2 dB attenuation per kilometer. Now this sounds somehow crazy because it says, uh, can we do this? The other thing is obviously we have to also check out how can we build these systems? Because now we have to build antenna feeder systems 
where we feed the antennas, and if, if we go to 200 gigs, for example, the cable losses uh, just building these systems are way too high. But the good news is we have 3D chip stacks coming along. Even my here, my grudgy old iPhone 5 has actually 16 chips stacked on top of each other in its flash memory, uh, with the flash memory by Samsung. And if you look at this, you have such a chip, and you have trenches, so it's not only the dentist that drills holes, but actually we drill holes also into silicon to make sure that we can fill these, uh, we can fill it with copper or just the lining with copper, then you have uh, a line, um, a coax cable, basically. So what you will see in future is a 3D chip stack where you have a passive transceiver uh, antenna subsystem on the top, silicon MEMS antennas. Then, for example, a 3.5 or silicon germanium carbon chip sitting on the next stage for the power amplifier and whatever all. Then we have, for example, our Butler matrix and then silicon germanium uh, bipolar RF, then the digital comms, all stacked nicely on top of each other, and down below we have the power management unit managing this whole system. If we do that, then we can reduce all the feeder losses, and then we can actually build these systems that we need. If you think this is too crazy to be true, uh, we have already started to design something like this at 200 gigs. Here you see some on-chip antenna arrays that came out of the factory, you see some a uh, low-noise amplifier, mixer, you see some ADCs uh, and DACs. And so the whole thing is coming together in our team here uh, in Dresden. Then, if we say, what about channel impulse response? And we started doing this only for board-to-board -board communication for uh, just a wireless backplane. And you see here we had some measurements set up. You see the one board, the other board, two antennas pointing to each other. And what do we see? That these boards actually have a problem because we don't only see the line of sight. We see a reflection, which is a double reflection, right? It's bouncing back and forth. Uh, so it's three times over the air. And we see something like 18 dB antenna attenuation, so 9 dB per reflection. Uh, even if we look at this in a slanted way, we see the same kind of reflection. So the question is, can we use these frequencies? And it turns out, yes. Um, however, we have to understand there's some border here where there is diffraction stopping and reflection only. Now, obviously, as some of you know, there have been measurements that in downtown streets, we see diffraction at 200 gigs or at 60 and 70 gigs. Why? All you need is a tree at the street corner and the leaves wiggling in the wind and it's a nice reflector and acts as a refraction. So even in this reflection-only domain, we see something like quasi-refraction. But the question is where to go. And so we said, let's check out these frequencies, and we bounce off here a wooden cabinet in our, uh, in our room. And what do we see? We saw exactly the 9 dB, 10 dB refraction loss also on the wooden cabinet. We see a very nice channel. Uh, you see the blue line, you can hardly see it, but here you see a nice peak, the impulse response, you see some reflections here on the table and chairs, and then you see a fairly flat channel. In the case that we go into the corner with a wooden cabinet and the brick wall, we see a little more frequency selectivity, but the same kind of uh, loss. And even if we go bounce off a piece of cloth, yes, something like this curtain here, what do we see? Now we see not a single impulse response, but we see now here real delay spread because we're going off all these ruffles. And we see a high s frequency selectivity, which is great in terms of making sure that we have obviously some frequency diversity. This is measured at frequency range at 230 to 320 gigs. If you do the link budget calculations, question is, and you can actually build even 300 gig systems. Oops. Uh, if you uh, do the link budget calculations, you actually see that, I mean, what do we have to look at? The received SNR is transmit, uh, then we have the gain at the transmitter, we have the loss, we have the gain at the receiver, and then we have a noise figure. That's basically the symbol equation, and I don't want to go into the details here, but uh, let's assume that we have 
a noise figure, a very high noise figure, we, we assume 10 dB, so that means we're looking at a really worst case scenario. Uh, the transmitter is 20 dBm, 100 milliwatts. Uh, then freeze pass loss at different frequencies gives us different path losses. And then we still assume that our reflections, a double reflection gives us 20 dB loss. So two bounces off a ceiling and a wall covers basically almost everything. The question is, what are the systems that we need to build for an 8x8 massive MIMO terminal? So uh, 64 antenna elements. Um, at 30 gigs, putting in 8x8 antenna elements, lambda half spaced, we need 4x4 square centimeters. That's actually too large to fit onto a chip stack. So we are having all these feeder losses. Or we have to go through cumbersome, hybrid, a packaging approach with losses incurring it, and then again building these systems four by four centimeters too large to fit into any terminal. At 60 gigs, we're cl coming close. At 120 gigs, fantastic. And these 120 gig systems are being built today. It is a mainstream technology which many communications people don't know. Uh, so now I'll touch that later. So now again, if we take this whole thing together and look at this in terms of terminal and base station in symmetric arrays, say we implant or put in the same antenna array on the base station and the terminal, we want to transmit at 30 gigs, then we need 45 antennas at each side, and we have something like 35 by 35 millimeter square. This is not doable in 3D chip stacking. Hybrid technology can only address this. If we go to 60 gigs, we are talking about only uh, two and a half centimeters squared. If we go to 240 gigs, we're talking about 12 millimeters squared. And this is fantastic. That is really nicely implementable. Now you say, okay, Gerhard, smoke and dope, because the terminals can be smaller antenna arrays and the access points larger, so let's do this. Say the terminal antenna has a size of 10 by 10 millimeters squared only. What is then the size doing the link budget calculation of the base station? Then the base station at 30 gigs has to have 11 by 11 centimeters square antenna array. This is not low cost. Um, so at 60 gigs, we're talking about five by five centimeters square. This is massive, yes, but it's okay. Uh, at 120 gigs, we're talking about three by three centimeters square and 240 gigs, we're talking about 14 millimeters square. Remember, at 240 gigs, we don't even have 2 dB per kilometer free space attenuation. So what does that mean? If we go to symmetric arrays, we sort of have a valley of trouble, valley of death, whatever you want to call it, uh, of frequencies with a no-go zone, just for a cost reason point of view, making these massive MIMO systems. And if we then go to asymmetric systems and say one square centimeter is okay in the terminal, we still have a no-go zone here, which is being addressed by many people. So I want to be sort of a little provocative and ask the question, are we doing the right thing? Yes. Why? Because the car industry is moving to 120 gigs. They're smarter than the wireless communications people, yes? Car radar of the future is currently being developed at 120 gigs. You think 78 gigs car radar is the thing? They're trying to move away because we communications people are coming to 70 gigs region. And so th they're designing currently chip systems at 120 gigs. And we think this is too complex. World Radio Conference 2019 should concentrate on the frequencies below 100 gigs. And I'm here to say, why do we communications people only always have to be the second or third people actually finding out that their frequencies higher up there that could be addressed by today's technology. Because if we take silicon germanium HBT technology of today, we can reach 700 gigs FTF max, which means it's easily possible to build integrated transceiver chips up to 300 gigs. So it's not an issue from a technology point of view addressing 300 gigs carrier frequency. Obviously, if we go to these frequencies, we can also change the licensing game completely. Today, we have to then build a rake receiver in space-time. 
Obviously, this will be a couple 10 nanoseconds later arriving here than the direct line of sight. So we have in angle, in space, and in time, a two-dimensional rake receiver to be designed. Good news is our crazy CDMS, CDMA uh, experiment of 3G actually gave us a lot of insight of how to do these things and how to build acquisition systems, etc. But now, that means we can then do space division multiple access. Obviously, yes, this is a double bounce talking to a terminal in around the street corner. But we can also go and have Vodafone and Telefonica using exactly the same frequency band. All they need is a certain spacing apart, little more than 10 meters, if we assume 30 dBi antenna gain, which we need anyway and a couple dBi antenna gain at the terminal side, then there's no reason why we cannot just have the same frequency band. So forget about frequency auctioning of uh, your spectrum only. You can then have really shared access. We only need somebody to manage to make sure that the base stations are separated far enough apart in space. And if you have this kind of an overlapping system, all you need to make sure is that then, okay, if the rake receiver only turns on this finger, and the other finger is turned off and is not used. So uh, it is just a space division multiple access system of a little bit more uh, roughiness. So we can in-band reuse our frequencies in these cases. It completely changes regulation. It's also maybe it's a pay-per-use kind of frequency or your paper base station installation. Uh, and an initiation license fee. Uh, so we can do something like cognitive spectrum sharing and a lot of the research that has been on cognitive radio, not knowing where to apply this, now we can start really using the technology. And with this, I would like to thank you for listening and I'm ready for discussions. Thank you, Aaron. Do we take questions now or yeah. later? I don't know how you... I, I think we can take a few minutes of questions now and uh, then the theater. Please, audience, go. Nice. Yes. Yeah, on these uh, high frequencies, I, I guess that the re reflection works uh, nicely, right? Um, but the penetration going from one room to the next room or from outdoor to indoor or something, there, there we have limitations, right? Well, the good news is we're in Sweden, so there are a lot of wooden houses, right? So we did measurements, a plasterboard wall with a single sheet plasterboard on every side gives us a little less than 10 dB attenuation, okay? So a wooden wall the same, actually less than that. Uh, if you take a double-sheeted plasterboard wall, like you use in bathrooms and acoustically decoupled rooms, mm. um, then you're talking about the 20 dB penetration loss. If you're then going indoor to outdoor, um, a typical situation with a brick wall and modern windows, obviously, yes, we have complete isolation until somebody opens the window. But um, for my way of thinking, why not start a startup that builds an indoor to outdoor cable feeder system, relay system, and offers this to the people. I mean, if you go and buy this for 10 euros in a store, plenty of people will do this. And I don't think we have to uh, hamper startup ideas for getting indoor to outdoor penetration laws covered with other kind of ways of doing it. That's the way I feel personally, because I mean, there's no reason why we cannot just have a little cable feed system. I also noticed that you did not, uh, you, you did recognize that there were some frequencies perhaps higher than today's uh, to 3 gigahertz until you reached uh, the problems at 25 there. What do you think about the usefulness of, of frequencies uh, around 10 or 15 gigahertz, for example? So, yes. I think, so if we're talking about this frequency range here, right, where we still see diffraction, so this is 6 to 15 gigs or something like that in that range. I think there's a lot to be gained in that frequency range, yes? So I think personally, it's too bad that World Radio Conference in November is not addressing these frequencies, but I think these are frequencies we really should cover and look at, yeah? Because we do not need the massive MIMO antenna gain in that case. 
We do need it for these frequencies, but then we have here the area where we don't want to be and here the area we would want it. Question. Yes. So, um, uh, in general, I, 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 I'm very happy to see there's more and more um, interest in the uh, uh, high frequency. The um, two comments that I, first one is um, maybe the link budget and yep. the coverage. Um, you, I understand that um, you, there's a, um, um, there's a 6 dB difference in terms of free space, uh, uh, free equation from from 30 to 60. Right. Right. Um, if it's multi-path environment, not uh, uh, free space, it may have a different um, um, uh, uh, coverage. So um, the, this uh, coverage issue uh, is number one. Uh, if you go in higher and higher. Number two, you mentioned about also about this terminal um, size, it is especially the antenna size for the terminal. Of course, uh, direct, you know, the simple equation uh, says that, of course, uh, is, is we can put much more antennas uh, if you go higher. But uh, if you go really higher, the, the chip components, especially the RF and, and PA efficiency, are getting worse and worse. So uh, if you're really um, uh, looking at some some look some some coverage okay to cover a certain distance and uh, and with the reasonable amount of the TX power at the tr at the terminal then the, um, there you know there must be some sweet spot okay yes 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 so obviously uh, you're touching something very important because uh, you remember the company called Cybeam it still exists but it sort of went broke once and the reason why because it did not have a power budget for the terminal end, so for the, uh, that fit into USB dongle, 1.8 watts, right? We had to basically, we can plug that in. I have such a Cybeam thing in my office. I can plug it in, but I have to plug in to an AC outlet to work with my wireless device, even though it's in a USB dongle. So it doesn't really make sense. Um, so yes, you're touching a very important point. If we go to these very high data rates, um, there are two things that come into play. The inefficiency of the power amplifier and the A to D converter and DA converter, right? Which consumes like a hell of a lot of power. And both can be addressed very nicely going back to our roots, GSM. What did we do? Constant modulus signaling. Do you remember the Motorola chipset? The first Motorola chipset for GSM, it had a one-bit ADC and was the super lowest power s solution. Even though they had a MLSE equalizer, it used a one-bit ADC and they had a whole concept built around a one-bit ADC. So what I'm trying to say is that, yes, you're absolutely correct, but per beam we're seeing flat channels, pretty flat channels. So if we really can get beam separation, and if we use the right modulation technique, not OFDM. We need peak to average power ratio of almost zero dB to get these kind of things working. Then we can get those done. And then you can get your PA efficiency from 6% of today up to 25 or whatever percent, which means your PA subsystem will consume not the 100 milliwatt, but 400 milliwatt at 100 milliwatt transmit power. And then we're sort of in a range that makes sense. The coverage uh, that we measure is, I mean, we easily can go 100 meters. No, with a single bounce or a double bounce, depending upon the, uh, what we're talking about. But a single bounce, 100 meters is easy. A double bounce, 50 to 60 meters is also. At 200 to 300 gigahertz. <coughs> yeah? OK, thank you. <coughs> Now we're running time, so yeah. I think uh, thank you very much. Uh, <coughs>